allergy on my face, so <laughs> please be patient with me. I am Beth Power. Thank you for coming. This is Elizabeth Kent. We are your coral tour guides today for Journey Through Lesbian Mecca. This is um, this is brought to you by the Sexual Minorities Archives. So your donations today will go to the Sexual Minorities Educational Foundation, which is um, a pending 501c3 nonprofit. So you can tax deduct this donation if you like. Um, in addition to myself and Elizabeth, who are on the the board of um, the archives. We have today Stephanie Billings, who signed you in. Uh, Stephanie is another board member with the archives. And the three of us would really like to welcome you and thank you for coming. The research for today's tour was conducted by Elizabeth as an, an intern, a former intern at the archives and is now a board member on the Archives Board. It was conducted at the Sexual Minorities Archives within our files and at the Sophia Smith Collection, Smith College. Uh, portions of the introduction that Elizabeth is going to give you and some of the historical facts were drawn from a book called Bisexual Spaces by Claire Hemmings. She's an English bisexual feminist woman. And that research was conducted at the Sexual Minorities Archives here. So I wanted to do a little housekeeping and then we'll get, we'll get started. The tour, each of you has a map and key historical facts, the dates for each of the stops. This is so you don't have to memorize dates while we're speaking to you. You can take this home and read it. And when we're speaking with you today, you can just listen to us. Because history is about storytelling. And we're going to tell you some stories about Northampton. Now, the problem with history is that who tells the stories? Um, honestly, LGBTQs don't usually tell the stories. Yes, heterosexuals tell the stories. And, and the problem with that is that if you read our local papers, even in this town, you'll sometimes see news about one of us in our LGBT community. But it's always when that person is doing something for the straight community or in the straight mainstream community. You rarely, if ever, hear accounts of when LGBTQs did something in our own community or built our own community, our own spaces. And yet the irony is that Northampton is what it is today, and we're going to demonstrate to you, because of the influx of lesbians in the 1970s who literally built this city and its underground culture and, and became an attraction for gay men, lesbians, bisexuals, trans people to come and move here and form more organizations and more businesses. Um, but those stories are not told in history books, our stories, and they're not usually reported on in the paper. Um, so we're gonna break the silence today. And the motto of the Sexual Minorities Archives is never again the silence for that reason so that we don't fall off the, the history pages, fall through the cracks, and our stories are untold. Um, so some housekeeping. You got your map and the his, historical facts. We're going to visit locations here in the downtown area and on Smith campus. When we get to Smith College, we're going to take a break. It's sort of almost midway. Um, we, we break at Nielsen Library in front of Nielsen. It's a nice grassy area, and there's also water and restrooms in Nielsen Library. So that will be a break. Um, we are going to 
um, uh, in addition to the downtown locations, tell you about some farther out locations that we're not going to physically go to. Uh, farther out in Ward 3 East, and then in Florence, which obviously we're not going to walk. So, um, but those we're going to show you photos of as we tell you the history of those locations. There's only a few of those. We would like to take your questions, but for the sake of time efficiency, we'd like to take them in two locations. One is at the mid-break at Nielsen Library on Smith. We'd be happy to answer your questions. And one is at the last stop, which is sort of near Spalitos and the bridge. Um, and then we'll take questions there. However, if you have a burning question before that, you can ask us, that means me or Elizabeth, as we're walking to the next, you know, if you want to just grab us and ask us your question. That's fine. Um, we'll probably, at the end of this, uh, sometime in a week or so, send you a survey so that you can give us your input, how it went for you, but also tell us additional history that you know of. We'd like to know if you, if you know of more things that have happened that we've omitted somehow. Um, I think everybody was asked if they object to being photographed or videotaped. This is your last chance if you do to raise your hand. Okay, that's cool. Thank you. Um, one last housekeeping thing is we need your help um, along the main street locations to make sure that our group, which is large, doesn't do two things. We shouldn't block pedestrians crossing, you know, passing on the sidewalk. And please let's not stand as a group in front of any doorway because we don't want to hamper any business. So the way that we do this is there are red bricks on Main Street, just like these below your feet. And there's also a sidewalk, like that gray sidewalk. So we want to stand on the red bricks. The red bricks are closer to the curb. And that way, pedestrians will still be able to pass along the sidewalk. Well, we'll remind you if we have to, or herd you like sheep. <laughs> but that's, you know, what we need to do in order to keep peace with the city. So we appreciate your help with that. Um, just before Elizabeth gets going on the intro, um, just a little bit about who we are, just a bit on that power. I, my credentials are, I've got, if you want to know credentials, I've got a bachelor's degree in American 20th century literature, and I got a master's degree sociocultural processes with an emphasis on black literature, 20th century American, and LGBT and women's 20th century American literature. I'm Elizabeth Kent, a bachelor's degree from Smith College, and recently a master's degree, which I'll tell you more about it, from Brandeis University. Um, I've been curating and directing the Sexual Minorities Archives since 1974, and I'm kind of a de facto community historian. Um, so that's a little bit about who we are. With that, I'll hand it to, um, to Elizabeth. <laughs> okay. So this is working? Yeah. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Elizabeth. I'm just going to warn everyone I've had food poisoning all weekend, so if I seem weird, that is why. Um, <laughs> Doing fine. Okay, so introduction. Since an article in the National Enquirer on April 21st, 1992, called Strange Town Where Men Aren't Wanted, 10,000 Cuddling, Kissing Lesbians Call It Home Sweet Home, Northampton, Massachusetts has often been referred to as Lesbianville, USA. However, as Meryl Cohn explained in her response entitled Northampton, 10,000 Cuddling, Kissing Lesbians, liberal attitudes fostered in this academic environment have long attracted progressive minded people. The prevailing outlook is broad minded, or at the very least, tolerant. Women steadily migrate to the land where their people have already settled. Word of mouth has, has built an ever-expanding community of lesbians who have found a safe and comfortable home. Indeed, as Claire Hemings writes in her book, Bisexual Spaces, since the late 1960s, Northampton and the surrounding areas of Amherst, South Hadley, and the Valley Hill Towns, together known as the Happy Valley from the Connecticut River Valley, 
have been home to a thriving lesbian community. As Michael Lowenthal notes, Northampton is something of a lesbian mecca to which all dykes must make at least one pilgrimage during their lives. Part of this can be attributed to the two women's colleges in the area, Smith College in Northampton and Mount Holyoke College in nearby, nearby South Hadley. Many lesbian feminists studied at these schools and stayed on after graduation. In the early 1970s, the establishment of women's and lesbian feminist cooperatives assisted in the gradual creation of this lesbian mecca. In the 1980s, lesbian influence became more incorporated into Northampton due to the establishment of many lesbian-owned businesses and cult cultural events, which in turn caused other businesses to begin to target lesbians with dyke discounts and lesbian-friendly atmospheres. Hemmings writes, culturally, the town offers lesbian music, dances, films, at local art cinemas, theater, readings, and academic papers. And this is set within a more general liberal, <coughs> liberal arts positive milieu. Even in 1982, Lindsay Van Gelder of Rolling Stone took notice of Northampton. Her article stated, the five college area around Northampton, Massachusetts is becoming a veritable lesbian Ellis Island. <laughs> 10 years later, the aforementioned National Enquirer article brought Lesbianville USA even greater national attention. Today, Northampton remains on par with places such as the Castro of San Francisco, California, and Provincetown, Massachusetts, and its reputation for being highly populated with LGBTQ individuals and having a queer-friendly atmosphere. This tour of Northampton provides a compiled queer history of Northampton that continues into the present. That's what I mean. We bought two of these, but one is not working. Um, so there is no way to teach a complete history of Northampton's LGBT community in one day. However, you're going to come away from this tour knowing much more than you do now. This history, her story, our story, is a story of struggle, creativity, inventiveness, organizing, victory, and pride. The research was done in the archives and at Sophia Smith. So now let's go to our first step. Walk a bit there and we'll take a look at Armory Street Lot. This is the parking lot behind Torrance in 1977 when Northampton Pride expanded <coughs> and became more popular. The rally, the vendor booths, and the performances after the march moved here. In 2008, one of the Pride Rally speakers at this location was Rachel Maddow. Um, the rally moved to the three county fairgrounds in 2012, so it's no longer here. Uh, before that, the Pride Rally was held in Pulaski Park, which is one of our stops. In 2008, at this location, the very first New England transgender Pride Rally assembled here after a march throughout the city. It attracted over 1,000 people. The founding organizers of Trans Pride included Drew Levisser, Beth Power, and Danica Marie Ali. And now, on to our second stop, Thorns Market. So we're going to get to Thorns Market and gather in front of it. Let's walk up this way, up the side street. Get a, get a shot of Thorns in the background. Okay, <laughs> commercial space today, for sure. But this was the site of many lesbian and gay spaces since the 1980s. Especially on the third floor of Thorns, Valley Women's Martial Arts, which, which used to be called the Nutcracker Sweet Dojo. <laughs> was a lesbian, oh. lesbian feminist who <laughs> had Self-Defense School, founded by Janet Elves, and Janet Elves was once Northampton's Poet Laureate from 2003-2005, and Beth Hope. We're going to pass around our first photo. This is Janet and Beth. Pass it in a circle, that would be great. Oh, there it is. Um, The self-defense school was located on the third floor of Thorns, and it held emergency meetings of the lesbian community to deal with threats in 1982, after the Pride March started. Also mentioned in 1983 and 1984 as a space for the lesbian community 
or how various media, such as alcohol or the lesbian community. Valley Women's Martial Arts is now located at One Cottage Street in East Hampton. The Gala, Gay and Lesbian Activist Office, those were the founders of our first Pride March, um, was also on the third floor here from 1982 to 1985. In 1985, the Lesbian Gay Empowerment Coalition met in the Gala office. It was created because of the new foster care policy in Massachusetts, which banned gays and lesbians from being foster parents. And due to increased harassment of the community in the years immediately following the start of the Pride March in Northampton, Haven, which stood for Harassment and Violence Emergency Network also held meetings yes. there in 1985. Yes. Annabelle's was another space. It was a lesbian space located on the third floor. It held events such as Visual Passions, in which local lesbian artists showed their art in 1985. Downstairs in Thorns, Loasis and 88s held lesbian dancing during the 1980s. And that was on the lower level, that big open space. That was for lesbian dancing in the 1980s. In Thorn Marketplace, people, <laughs> right in the middle of town. <laughs> One example of many queer art shows here on the third floor was by Yoha Ralph in 1987. Yoha is a trans man who lived in Northampton and displayed his artwork in Thorns Market's Gallery 1 and 2. His exhi exhibition of his paintings was called Prostitutes, Biker Women, and Leather Dykes. Pride and Joy, previously located at 20 Crafts Avenue, came under new management in 2011 and moved here to Thorns with a new name, Northampton's Pride and Joy. The store was originally called Pride's, and it opened in 1992. Pride and Joy was always queer-owned, and they sold LGBT merchandise, gifts, books, magazines, with music, clothing, adult toys, and jewelry. The store also rented LGBT movies, and they were a source of information for the LGBT community of Northampton, and somewhat they served as a drop-in space for some, especially what was on Crabs Ave. Lesbian author Leslie Newman, author of Heather Has Two Mommies, and the very first lesbian poet laureate of Northampton, has done readings at Pride and Joy. Pride and Joy had multiple owners. First, Martha Nelson, Beth and Karen Bellavance Grace, then Mark Carmine, and Jennifer Harlan and Joy Rain. In the early 2000s, Mark Carmian also founded Venture Out, Mark's Gay Man, an outdoor adventure club for LGBTQs. The organizational papers from Venture Out were donated by Mark to the Sexual Minorities Archives. Pride and Joy officially closed on April 27th of this year. Okay, so now step with us to 160 Main Street. Women's Liberation, 
In 1970, Amherst Women's Liberation opened the Valley Women's Center on the second floor of 200 Main Street, upstairs, and held a forum on lesbian politics. Valley Women's Center became a feminist, socialist, cultural, and literary drop-in space for lesbians, as well as a key space for lesbian separatist organizing in Northampton. In 1974, the name changed to Valley Women's Union. Starting in 1975, the space also housed the Lesbian Gardens Coffee House and the Sweet Coming Bookstore. Also in 1975, Lesbian Gardens had a Dykes and Tykes group gathering. In 1976, a cultural commercial space for women called The Egg was also opened here by the Greasy Gorgon Garage, Majira Press, and Women's Film Co-op, which were all located at, located at 19 Holly Street, and we'll talk about that later on the tour. Um, Lesbian Gardens moved to the Common Moon Club in 1976, which was another stop on the tour. In 1975, the Valley Women's Union held the bimillennial Lesbian Week in the Valley, celebrating more than 2,000 years of lesbian survival. The space held a variety of groups that centered, centered on issues such as child care, fat women's support, sex stereotyping in schools, women against the war, women and their bodies, a women's film co-op, a women's journal, a writer's support group, and a writer's workshop. Okay. And here we're also going to talk about um, the next stop, which we're not going to, is Pride Zone Youth Center down where the Maplewood shops are on 2 Maple Avenue. Um, so here they held a GLBTQA youth group that started in 2000 and it continues today. Um, they held a specifically trans youth group starting in 2001 as well as Continuum, a support group for the gender variant community in the Pioneer Valley in 2003. A chapter of Collage, Children of Lesbians and Gays Everywhere also began meeting here in 2003. Okay, and now we're moving on to City Hall. Okay, thanks to the city, we have a nice new sidewalk here to stand upon. <laughs> Hello, Lorelei. Welcome I to bet. the Journey Through Lesbian Mecca Tour. I nice love it. One stop. <laughs> okay, so this is, this is City Hall. This has a lot of history for our community here. The Hampshire County AIDS Task Force began meeting in City Hall around 1991. Since 1998, the Northampton Human Rights Commission, which was established at City Hall, has included sexual orientation and gender identity or expression in its non-discrimination policy. On the courthouse steps, a Transgender Day of Remembrance vigil was held in 2002. In 2003, a celebration was held when the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts ruled that the ban on gay marriage was unconstitutional. One couple of the seven couples who acted as plaintiffs in Goodrich versus the Department of Public Health, the court case that resulted in same-sex marriage becoming legal in the first state of the union here in Massachusetts, were from Northampton. They were Heidi Norton and Gina Smith, now the Norton Smiths. Many same-sex marriages have taken place on the steps of City Hall. Two transgender pride rallies have been held on these steps. And also, Mary Claire Higgins, an out lesbian, served as the mayor of Northampton from 1999 to 2011. And her offices were in City Hall. Karen Bellavance Grace, a previous owner of Pride and Joy, also served as an aide to Mary Claire Higgins when she was mayor. Still getting used to this baby. It's pink, that's why I don't like it. <laughs> okay, let's go to Unitarian Society right next, next door here. A lot of our history is in this building as well. Many, uh, me, this is a meeting place for many GLBTQ groups, such as in the late 1980s, the Valley Gay Alliance and the early Lesbian, Gay, and Bisexual Community Center. Planning meetings were held here. An openly gay Unitarian minister was also a guest speaker. Site of many transgender Day of Remembrance vigils since the early 1990s. The Lesbian, Gay, and Bisexual Community Center project started in the church basement in 1991. In 1994, a community forum on domestic partnership was held here. 
The Lesbian Avengers also met here in 1994, and one of their projects, listen up, one of their projects was to hand out flyers on Valentine's Day at a public school that said, quote, ask about lesbian love. <laughs> A transgender support group called the Sunshine Club started here. And they started meeting in, in 2001 here and eventually moved to Hadley, where they still meet. And the Northampton Pride Parade and rally planning meetings have also, some of them, taken place here. The Reverend Janet C. Bush, an out trans woman, has been the minister of this church since 2009. The Unitarian Society is open, affirming, and welcoming to LGBTQ people and frequently flies the rainbow flag in front of its building. Now let's walk over to Pulaski Park. A key location for queer history. Um, you know, if I had to pick one that was, in my estimation, the most important, I'd have to say Pulaski Park. Um, let me just get out my photos before I go into my thing. So the first Northampton Pride marches rallied here, starting in 1982 and continuing through 1996. Gala. The gay and lesbian activists founded Northampton Pride in 1982, coalitioning with a range of women's groups, anti-racism groups, labor groups, and peace groups. The theme of the first Northampton Pride March was defending our sexual freedom, and 500 people came out to march. The gala members who founded Northampton Pride included Jerry Scapitulo, now living in Boston, Kim Christensen, Kerio Spooner, Peggy Shannon, Elaine McCrate, Sam Gianelli, and Jetta Frazier, an African-American lesbian whose activism bridged both the black civil rights movement and the gay and lesbian movement. <laughs> Early Northampton Pride marches always included leaders from communities of color as speakers at the rally, such as the late Marshall Yates, a lead organizer of the 1987 Gay March on Washington, Mel King, former state representative from Boston and organizer for Reverend Jesse Jackson's Rainbow Coalition, Barbara Smith, founder of Kitchen Table Press, and Gwendolyn Rogers from Dice Against Racism Everywhere. One of the photos that I'm handing, I've handed out is Gwendolyn marching in that early first march with the banner, Dice Against Racism Everywhere. In 1983, Mayor Musanti, mayor then, refused to sign a letter endorsing that year's Pride March. Refused. However, John Oliver, Bill Nagel, District Attorney Michael Ryan, and other regional politicians did sign it. At the fourth Pride rally in 1985, founders of Northampton Pride, there's a photo of this, I'm passing around, climbed up the fire escape on the Academy Music, beyond those trees, still there, and unfurled the gala banner. They were activists. You know, and in my opinion, unfurling that gala banner right here in downtown Northampton broke it, broke the silence, broke the invisibility. And it said, guess what? We're here, we're queer. Get used to it. Gala is here. The early marches and rallies were sites of significant homophobic backlash. Significant. Requ requiring police protectors protection from the protesters. And, and you'll see another image that's going around of that. Members of the Faith Baptist Church and from Shun, which stood for Stop Homosexual Unity Now, and NOAA, 
which stood for a national organization against homosexuality, gathered here to protest, you know, crawl out of the rocks, under the rocks, and gather here to protest and to try to stop our pride rallies here in Pulaski Park. The rallies had political and activist speeches, as well as entertainment, and many well-known music groups performed. And nationally recognized speakers, such as Leslie Feinberg spoke here, Warren Blumenfeld, and Elaine Noble, Barney Frank, and many others have spoken at Pride rallies, along with local politicians and city officials. In 1993, it was Mayor Mary Ford who began the annual tradition of issuing a mayor's proclamation to recognize LGBT Day, Pride Day in the city. Now, following the 1998 Pride, two gay men were beaten on Main Street. As a result of that, 700 people immediately protested outside of City Hall. This park was also the site of a rally for rights of gays and lesbians to be foster parents following the fifth annual Lesbian and Gay Pride Parade in 1986. Okay, so I have some photos. Okay, so the Academy of Music. Um, the Academy of Music opened on May 23rd, 1891. Um, Anna Janakaze, a female-to-male cross-dresser and likely queer individual who lived in Northampton from 1908 to 1923, expressed her support of the Academy of Music um, in a 1919 letter to the editor of the Daily Hampshire Gazette. Um, R. Warren Clark, who is the first photograph that you'll see, um, he was a male-to-female cross-dresser. He impersonated vaudevillian entertainer Sophie Tucker on stage, and he performed at the Academy of Music in the 1980s, and um, he was a founding member of the Young at Heart Chorus, which also performed here. Um, the Academy of Music has had many other queer-oriented cultural events, such as the Out for Real LGBT film series, um, the Miss Trans New England pageant, and the Pioneer Valley Gay Men's Chorus. In late January or early February of 1983, graffiti reading Dykes Die, which is another photograph there, um, was tagged on the sidewall of the Academy of Music over there. Um, in response to the first Northampton Pride and the visible emergence on the streets of Northampton of lesbians and gay men. The photo of this graffiti was published in an article by Karen Zener in the February 1983 Boston Phoenix about the wave of death threats and harassment in the lesbian and gay community here following the first Northampton Pride March. During lesbian and gay community meetings with the representatives of the city and Mayor Masante, people demanded that something be done about the large Dykes Dye graffiti downtown. The city acted quickly to remove it. In response, a labrys graffiti was painted underneath the bridge overpass on North Street as a sign of lesbian power and strength. Uh, the Labrys graffiti is still at that location today, and there's a photograph of that, too. Um, in March of 2012, Pioneer Valley Performing Arts, a group comprised of high school students, put on a controversial play here called The Most Fabulous Story Ever Told. Um, this was written by famous gay playwright Paul Rudnick, and it was a retelling of the Garden of Eden story with Adam and Eve, replaced by Adam and Steve and drag queens. The play was picketed by religious protesters and counter-picketed by supporters of the play. So I think we can stay, still stay here and talk about the Sullivan Building. I like to look at that beautiful yellow building across the street. It's the Sullivan Square Building. The Northampton Center for the Arts was located on the third floor there. And this site has also held many queer-oriented cultural festivals, such as Flower, which stood for for Love of Women Economic Resources in 1987. Alumni News, The Doris Day Years, a play by Sarah Dreyer, lesbian playwright, and the Just for Laughs benefit for the People with AIDS Coalition of Western Massachusetts were held here in 1989 in the Northampton Center, for what used to be Northampton Center for the Arts Space. That space has also held lesbian concerts, women's dances with records spun by DJ Mary B, and auctions to benefit the LGBT community. Nationally known lesbian comic Leah Delaria performed there in the 1990s. 
and some protested the performances of Annie Sprinkle, who is um, a lesbian erotic performance artist. But she performed there in the 1990s and actually closed down one of the shows <laughs> only one <laughs> evening. Um, in 1993, the group Lesbians for Lesbians <laughs> held a separate pride event here at the, uh, the Center for the Arts space. Um, it was a pride event for lesbians only called a Lesbian Liberation Rally at which Alex Dobkin performed. This was held at the same time as the general Northampton LGBT Pride Rally taking place nearby in Pulaski Park. The Northampton Center for the Arts closed um, this year. I forgot to mention that um, that Lesbian Liberation was, Rally was held to protest the inclusion of bisexuals in the Pride March. So the Center for the Arts closed this year. Also in this building, on the first floor, Suite 111, used to be the home of the GLBT Community Center Project of Western Massachusetts, which began in the year 2000. It was located on the first floor. It consisted of a drop-in space with a small library, resource binders, and a meeting space for queer groups. State Street is the store Fly By Night um, at 21 State Street. It's a highly su successful, high quality furniture store owned by a gay male couple that has been in Northampton since 1988. And now we're going to walk down West Street to where the North Star used to be, at the corner of West Green Street. dancing most nights. It was the only queer owned bar in Northampton um, until Club Metro, Club Metro opened in 1996 and that's where Divas is now. Um, it also held dances and benefits for LGBT organizations such as the Midsummer Night's Dinner slash Dance sponsored by the Valley Gay Alliance and the Lesbian Calendar. In 1988 the North Star held the first annual Community AIDS Benefit Dinner and Dance. Um, they hosted the Gala Halloween Costume Ball and the Northampton Pride March Dance Benefit in 1989 as well as an ACT UP benefit in 1992. The North Star became The Grotto in 1995. Um, the Grotto was a progressive and modern rock bar and nightclub. The seafood part of the establishment closed. Um, it struggled financially in 2002 and also eventually closed. And then uh, one location that we're gonna talk about that's not here is Veterans Fields, which is uh, at 88 West Street, kind of down that way-ish. Um, and Veterans Field used to be a location for the Northampton Pride Valleys. 2005 Northampton Pride March and Rally, two women, Julie Albetsky and Sandy Beach, were legally married on stage here, um, and they won a drawing for a honeymoon package. This may have been the first legal queer wedding to take place in a public space in the nation. Veterans Field is now a skateboard park. So I'm going to give you two photos. <laughs> yeah, that. One of them is the Green Street Cafe and the other is the Dyke Dorm Lesbian Rooming House. It's awful that it was torn down. Oh. So so there were two important pieces of our history history here. And this is this is or I make I get emotional because yeah. we're standing in the ruins. So the first was the Green Street Cafe at 6466 Green Street. It's a photo of it going around. Cafe was opened in 1991 by two gay men, 
John Sielski and his partner James Dosmati. It was very popular for many years, considered the finest gourmet restaurant in Northampton. The cafe served sort of French cuisine, often grown by the couple or from local food growers, and had musicians perform, and on the walls were painted community murals. While the cafe first had a congenial relationship with Smith College, whom the owners rented the property from, controversy occurred beginning in 2004 with the construction of Smith's new engineering building, Ford Hall. That's Ford Hall right here. And you can see how close it is to where this property ended, which is basically where the grass starts. The owners withheld rent. The owners of the cafe withheld rent, citing a violation in the terms of their lease due to noise from the construction, the loss of their parking spaces, and structural damage to the cafe, all of which resulted in a drop in business. The dispute went to court, and Smith repeatedly attempted to have the cafe evicted and rejected offers from community members to pay the rent that was owed by the two men. The cafe was ultimately forced to close in January of 2012, and the couple was left with a large debt that they incurred from years of legal fees. Smith College recently demolished this building to convert it into a, quote, green space. Also at this site was the Green Street Lesbian Rooming House, 66 Green Street, arguably the location that enabled Northampton in the late 60s through 70s and a little later on to become Lesbianville, USA. This is the spot where lesbians came in, like the Ellis Island, and lived here affordably. They came in from Chicago, New York, San Francisco, mm -hmm. Baltimore, the South, and they lived, and they couldn't afford rents here for a while. A number of those original gals are in their late 70s and 80s now, and they are, they're devastated by this. And, you know, they remember, and they live in Laurel Park, and, you know, yeah, they're around. I remember, too, because I had a friend who lived here, and I visited her. Her name was Shlomit, and she lived here for a while. So this building, the Green Street Lesbian Rooming House, was also called the Dyke Dorms. Rooming, it was on, um, if you look at that photo that's going around, there's a, there's a house that's positioned in the back of the storefront. It was taken out. It was a Victorian house. And you would go in through this first floor entrance that was next to the storefront, and then you'd walk up these stairs and you'd find all these rooms that were for rent. It was also called the Dyke Dorms. It was a rooming house for lesbian women in the community, not associated with Smith, not associated with Smith College. The building was owned by Housing and Economic Resources for Women, or HER, Inc., a nonprofit affordable housing organization for women. HER, Inc. rented the 15 single rooms to low-income women from the early 1970s until 1992. Uh, Dyke Dorms had a live-in manager, but it was run in a cooperative man manner with each new applicant interviewed collectively before being allowed to move in. Processing, processing, yeah. lesbian processing. Kay <laughs> <laughs> Marion Raymond, a lesbian artist, she's an elder now, lived here and drew many of the lesbian women that she knew to come to live in Northampton in the Dyke Dorms. Log books from the Dyke Dorms dated from 1977 to 1992 are now in the Sophia Smith collection at Smith College, ironically. <laughs> they reveal concerns ranging from dirty dishes to lesbian feminism 
to queer dancing being allowed at La Mix. The Dyke Dorms can be said to be the physical location of the, quote, lesbian Ellis Island, as women from all across the country migrated here to find its inexpensive monthly rents the main factor in being able to move to Northampton 70s and 80s. Word of mouth and publications like Lesbian Connection let lesbians know about the availability of rooms here at the Dyke Dorms. In 1992, the building was sold by her, Inc., and became a co-ed rooming house. Smith College bought the building in 2007. Okay, so they only allowed it to stand for six more years. So, in my opinion, when they bought this building, they knew yeah. they wanted this, the, yeah. the property for the, for the college. The Dyke Dorms and the Green Street Cafe were located in the same building. And this building had been constructed sometime between 1884 and 1895. And both had been demolished by Smith College to be converted into green space. The demolition was delayed for a while by the Northampton Historical Commission, but in the end, Smith College won its long-standing intent to take the building down. Now, speaking of, of Smith, I'm going to cross the street. Elizabeth will lead us in to Smith College to learn the queer history there. And that's where our break is going to be in front of Nielsen Library. So a break is in sight. <laughs> so much to the importance of what you're doing to not erase the history that this city has tried to erase. And I just really want to thank you for that. They, they can't silence us. And thanks to, thanks to you. It's little red light says, ah. And so here are the people on the Lesbian Mecca tour, now taking a break in front of the Nielsen Library at Smith College. And we'll learn more after the break. Existence. Um, one dance was held in 1981 to benefit the Common Woman Club. In 1984, Hover House was closed due to what is considered a more organized attack on the Lesbian Alliance by the administration. Hover House, now Parsons Annex, was a co-op, meaning that fewer students lived there and they cooked their own food and they didn't have a housekeeper. It came to be known as a predominantly lesbian student house. Although the, although the administration claimed that Hover House was closed due to a smaller number of incoming students and a lack of the need for two co-ops, the closing was viewed as an attempt to reverse Smith College's growing reputation as a school with a high proportion of lesbians. Smith students staged a sit-in in President Conway's office and a protest march outside, but Hover House was still closed. Fed Power was among community members who sat in at the protest. Also in 1984, the fifth Berkshire Conference in the History of Women was held in Smith College, and it included more than 15 lesbian panels and a 24-hour lesbian caucus room. In 1986, the Lesbian Alliance began calling themselves the Lesbian Bisexual Alliance, although evidence shows they did not officially change the name until 1988. In 1990, the first celebration of sisterhood was held. Now called celebration in order to be more inclusive of transgender and genderqueer students, the celebration of sisterhood was a response to issues of homophobia on campus. It is an event that takes place in the steps of Wilson House and the Quad. It begins with a candlelight vigil and then there are skits and performances. From 1990 to 1983, coming out day slash week was also held. In 1992, the Lesbian Bisexual Alliance held its first general meeting in Nielsen Browsing Room. Events that they discussed included the Radical Debutante Ball, a women of color support group, anti-biphobia workshops, poetry readings, anti-racism workshops, anti-homophobia workshops, LBA sports, coffee houses, and speakers from Lambda Legal Defense Fund and the National Lesbian and Gay Task Force. In 1998, the LBA became the Lesbian Bisexual Transgender Alliance. There is evidence of the first drag ball in 1999 in Davis Ballroom, a tradition that also continues to the present. In 2001, the LBTA had a trans committee, and in 2002, PRISM was established for queer students of color. In 2003, LBTA became Spectrum, and Tangent, a separate group for transgender students, was established, and they held a Trans Awareness Week. Also in 2003, Smith students voted to remove pronouns from the language of the Student Government Association Constitution in order to be more trans-inclusive. In 2006, the Resource Center for Gender and Sexuality was established in the basement of Wesley House, which is on the other side of the campus center down there. Um, many organizations on campus that deal with gender and sexuality issues hold meetings there, and it includes a small library with queer books and movies. 
Tangent became the Gender Action Advocacy Alliance, G3A, in 2006, which became inactive from 2007 to, to, to 2008 and was reestablished as Transcending Gender in 2008 to 2009. Transcending Gender is still active today, but Spectrum became inactive after 2007. PRISM is also still active, as is a newer group called Q&A, which has been very active in the current controversy over the denial of admittance to trans women at Smith College. Uh, when Smith chose not to review the application of out trans woman Calliope Wong due to a male gender marker on her FAFSA, Q&A, Transcending Gender, and other students worked with the administration to facilitate a review of their admissions policies in regard to trans women applicants. Smith College is also home to the Sophia Smith Collection, which is down there in the alumni gymnasium. Um, this was established in 1942, and it's one of the largest international archival collections of primary sources in women's history. It includes much material on sexuality and sexual orientation, such as the Oral History Project documenting lesbian lives. John M. Green Hall in Elm Street has been a location for concerts, lectures, and events open to the public over the years, including women's and lesbian events. One example from 1986 was a concert by the music group Sweet Honey and the Rock, a group of African-American feminists and lesbians. The event was produced by Clay Lady Productions and sponsored by the Smith College Women's Resource Center. Notable Smith College alumni include Tammy Baldwin, the first out lesbian elected to the U.S. Senate, and Yolanda King, daughter of Martin Luther King Jr. and gay activist. Okay, so now we're going to go up on Elm Street at St. John's Church. featured in Queer Noho, a queer culture guide to Northampton in 1993 as the meeting place of the Valley Gay and Lesbian, or BGAL, Alcoholics Anonymous group, which was founded here in 1904. This, later, this group later became called the Valley Gay, Lesbian, Bisexual, and Transgender Alcoholics Anonymous group which celebrated its 29th anniversary just this April. They still meet here today on, on Friday nights and are the only queer AA group in the Northampton area. The Pioneer Valley Gay Men's Chorus rehearsals were and are held here as well. St. John's is known as an LGBT welcoming congregation and flies the rainbow flag. Now I'm gonna tell you about location in Florence that we're not gonna to go to. But you can picture it's just down the road into Florence at 115 Pine Street. Um, this was the residence of Marion Turner. Now I know, except for the few of you, you've never heard of Marion Turner. <laughs> Marion Turner was an African-American male assigned at birth individual who lived and worked in Florence from 1898 to 1903 as a companion and helper to an elderly white woman, Mrs. J.D. Atkins. Turner was a cross-dresser, as evidenced by photographs of Turner in both male and female attire. I'm going to pass these around.
and also evidenced in a handwritten document called Re Recollections of Florence People Who Attended Cosmian Hall by Anna Pauline Frederick. Frederick st states in that document that Turner dressed as both a man and a woman and that the community referred to Turner sometimes with male and sometimes with female pronouns. Um, this didn't have no problem with it either. An article in the December 21, 1900 issue of the Daily Hampshire Gazette states that Turner hosted a gathering of 26 young African Americans who came up from the South and, and it was held at Mrs. J.D. Atkins house at 115 Pine Street. Though we don't know what the purpose of this gathering was, we speculated it could be an early gathering of black homosexuals, it could be an early gathering of black youth looking to migrate from the south to the north, but we do know that the gathering was likely connected to the utopian organization in Florence that Mrs. Atkins was involved with. This is pre-Stonewall history that we uncovered at the Sexual Minorities Archives. So uh, now we're going to take a walk down Masonic Street, which is rich in history, and go to where the common woman club was. It was at 78 Masonic, which is now the Mosaic Cafe over here. We're standing here because we don't want to block the business. But 78 Mos uh, Masonic was the Common Woman Club. Uh, this com the Common Woman Club was started in 1976. This was started by the first wave of lesbians that came into Northampton and started creating spaces for women only. Nine women wanted to open up a women's restaurant structured on a collective model. They bought the property, not only there, but here. 68, which is behind you, and 78. And there are some outbuildings behind it. They bought this property. Um, and they did so in August of 1976 and they served their first meal at the Common Woman Club on December 19, 1976. After the closing of the women's back room at the Gala Bar, which we're gonna to go to later, in January of 79, the Common Woman Club became the only women's social space for women in the valley. So women would drive here you know, not only from Northampton, but Holyoke, Springfield, the Valley, Maine. Greenfield. Maine. Maine. I was in Maine at the time, and I can't get Yes. Uh, probably, probably further out, too, than even yes. other states to come to the Common Woman Club. So we have someone here who went to it. That's awesome. Um, common Woman was a combination of a restaurant and a performance space, as well as a place for networking and the Resource Center, and it offered information about events, housing, referrals for counseling, and advocacy programs. I mean, before the internet, you had to go to a physical space in order to get information like that. You couldn't just go online. There was no online. Yeah. Um, 
Only women were welcome at the Common Woman Club. No men. <coughs> and it was known as the women's only, uh, women's only space in Northampton while it was open. Lesbian gardens also moved to the Common Woman Club in 1976. Ceres, that's C-E-R-E-S, Inc., was the group of women, the nonprofit corporation, whose original goal was to function as an umbrella organization for women's businesses and organizations. Now, you can see by this model how things started to be built here economically for women and by women in Northampton. It didn't just come from nowhere. It was the work of this collective and others pooling their money, making things, getting physical space for women to be in. The Common Woman Club was the last project of Ceres, Inc. They, um, they owned, as I said, this, this club, um, this space behind you, which I'm going to tell you about, which was Woman Fire Books, originally, and the Nutcracker Sweet jo Dojo, which met first in, this, in the back of this bookstore, uh, which is now Bella's. So Common Woman Club had music events such as Flash Silver Moon in 1981, and the Lesbian Craft Show and Sale in 1980. In 1982, Common Woman closed due to a lack of energy, money, and commitment. Ceres sold this property, that property, that piece of it, 78, to Bill Streeter, who had a bookbinding business there for nearly 30 years. Uh, Silver Maple Bindery, when Bill retired in 2008, was sold to the current owners, the Mosaic Cafe. So a piece of, of history was that while um, this space was still the bindery, Silver Maple Bindery was named after a huge silver maple tree that was located across the street here on Masonic, roughly where that woman in the orange shirt is walking. That sidewalk wasn't there. There was a huge silver maple that was over 150 years old that branched over Masonic Street. And that's why the bindery was named Silver Maple. Well, it was threatened at one point by the city for removal because they wanted to put in this new sidewalk and take it out and widen the street so cars could pass. So when it was threatened for removal, community members, including lesbian artist and her historian, K. Marion Raymond, sat up in the branches of the tree <laughs> to protest, and some of them chained themselves to the tree so it wouldn't be removed to no avail. The city obviously took it down. So if you want to move a little bit more this way, I'll tell you the history of this building. You can stand here for a <laughs> Okay, so um, 68 Masonic Street is Bella today, which is fabulous because it's still uh, in the hands of women and it's a lesbian-owned vegetarian restaurant. It didn't always used to be Bella. It used to be Woman Fire Books. And within Woman Fire Books, the Nutcracker Sweet Dojo which was the predecessor, as you recall, to Valley Women's Martial Arts. So, Women Fire Books was a feminist bookstore that opened in 1976. 1976! So this was the first queer-owned bookstore in Northampton. This predated Pride and Joy. This was the very first. It was originally owned by Ceres, Inc., this property along with the Common Woman Club. Do you remember the two, the two women that ran the, ran the bookstore? 
Yes, yes. The um the woman fire we're gonna we're gonna talk more about woman fire when it gets to Sunday. Oh, okay. With that history. But it was Jill Krolick and Kirio Spooner who owned uh, woman fire books. So when uh, when the common one closed and the property had been sold in 1982, Women Fire Books moved to 22 Center Street, which is a storefront to the right of the Iron Horse, which is now part of the Iron Horse. But that's where Women Fire Books lived most of its life, mm. on Center Street. Um, they had a good relationship, Women Fire Books did with the Iron Horse. Um, Women Fire often hosted lesbian uh, events, and they found lesbian music acts for the Iron Horse uh -huh. to, to have a space to perform there. Woman Fire Books was the target of much anti-gay harassment after our first Pride March. For example, in 1985, they received a bomb threat, and they had to evacuate the bookstore. There were handwritten death threats I shun, stop homosexual unity now, pushed under their front doorway, signed by shun. We have copies of those notes, those handwritten threats in the archives. Um, the store's windows were se egged several times during the early 1980s. Uh, Woman Fire Books closed in 1989. And that was due to competition from Lenaria Books and Woman Fire's policy of not censoring what it sold. So Woman Fire Books sold lesbian porn magazines like On Our Backs and Erotica vid videos, uh, and they became a target of anti-porn feminists. Some of them would go into the store and pour glue on the magazines. Others would steal items. Um, so the Nightcracker Sweet Dojo was here in the back. And I'm going to pass around a photo of this guy like this here. I was a lesbian feminist karate and self defense school that opened here in 1976. So on the side of the building that now you see Bella. You've got this uh, artwork. Before that was a, was a cartoon of olive oil crushing a can of spinach. <laughs> That's where the photo is going around. And the balloon of the cartoon said, spinach is a crunch. <laughs> um, this dojo was eventually moved to Colin's Marketplace and became larger there, Valley, Valley, Valley Women's Martial Arts. Um, other events related to Trans Pride and Northampton Pride have taken place here also. 
Uh, Queer-themed documentaries such as Transparent in 2011 have been screened here. The Media Education Foundation is also a progressive producer of educational DVDs for college and high school curriculum, many of which deal with LGBT-related issues such as resisting homophobia and LGBT individuals in sports. Now we're going to walk up a little bit. Masonic Street. adopted a girl child legally. So I mean, family forming an early girl among women. Maybe the Masonic Mirror. Maybe. Masonic Mirror So Yeah. We don't know. Been. We'll find out. Could have been right there too. We're gonna go to the women's mural. Rochelle Sheaf and Wednesday Sorokin. In 2003, six contemporary women were added. Peace activist Frances Crow, um, Mayor Mary Ford, out lesbian Mayor Mary Claire Higgins, domestic violence activist Yoko Kato, coach Agnes Gush Valenta, former Smith College President Ruth Simmons, and Jesse Benoy, a friend to the homeless and needy. Um, additionally, the section on the mural showing two women sitting in chairs talking with each other originally had a red heart floating in the space between them. This heart was defaced with red paint and eggs thrown against the mural by someone shortly after the mural was painted. Hmm. Yes. So the significance of the heart being erased is that it's a women's mural, but we're looking for lesbians in this mural, right? In the women's history? Now what do we what, what, what did they do when they first painted it? was subtle. They put two women in a chair, 
talking and they put a heart between them. They're not even hugging or kissing. And immediately that heart was egged and inked and it was defaced and it was never And the only the other lesbian bit, a very important bit, is the addition of there of the native. And she's represented, and you can see in that group, there's a sign that says pride. That's for our pride, for queer pride. And she's the figure in the black suit with the kind of white shirt on. That's big. That's a little skinnier. <laughs> That's when she started. Oh, yeah. <laughs> her. And what was baby was painted in So that was even before the pride march. That just went up right. So there was a fact and it's invisible. Does the city uh, maintain the funding or do the I mean fund the maintenance? Yes. Okay. Yes. And they, they funded the renovation. Let's go over to Center Street by the Iron Horse. The mining where you can see the buildings. <laughs> So here's the Iron Horse Music Hall. That's the main entrance. And this entrance over here is where Wood Fire Books used to be. Um, so the Iron Horse Music Hall opened in 1979. It's a concert venue and restaurant that has hosted many queer singers and bands such as Diane Lindsay and Sue Fink in 1985, Gal, Feminist Performance Art, and Rude Girls in 1985 as well. Um, the Iron Horse still hosts many LGBT performers today. For example, Deadly Nightshade, a lesbian band popular in Northampton in the 1970s that includes queer alumni from Smith College and Mount Holyoke College performed here in May 2013. Okay, so let's just walk down the block just to uh, in front of Tap Street. I took guitar lessons oh, for uh, several years from Diane Sanabria after meeting her with three girls. Been a lot, there's been a lot of queer going on here over the years. Um, tapestry Health, um, but even before it was Tapestry Health, many queer groups met here, especially on the third floor. In the late 1980s, for example, a teen support group sponsored by Lifeline Institute met here, a queer teen support group in 1980. That's, that's pretty cutting edge. Um, as did a lesbian parenting group and a support group and a discussion for dykes with disabilities and illness in 1989. Other groups that have met here included ACT UP, Men With Men, a weekly group of and for gay and bisexual men. This is six And the Valley Lesbian Group, which was an Alcoholics Anonymous group for LGBTQ people interested in leather. The Family Planning Council, which started here in 1973, preceded Tapestry Health, and it hosted HIV testing here. HIV testing here in 1973 in Northampton before the onset of the AIDS crisis. Tapestry Health itself opened here around 1999, and it is still here today. But Tapestry's main office is in Florence. This is a, a branch office of Tapestry Health. We have a needle exchange here. Wonderful programs run out of this space. Many well-known lesbians in the community <laughs> They wanted their offices to be here in 16th Center Street in Central Chambers. That was the thing in the late 80s. So the ones in 1987 that we could trace that had offices here included Linda Shear, who became a CPA after she was um, had co-founded a lesbian separatist re recording company called Old Lady Blue Jeans. Susan Ritter, an attorney at law, had offices here, Dr. Joe Schneider, who was a chiropractic physician, and Delia Roselle, who was a massage therapist. In addition, there have been many lesbian therapy practices here, especially in the 1990s to 2000s. 
So if you'll just turn a little to, to look at gazebo, uh, which some of you are standing in front of. Um, gazebo, 14 Center Street. It's a laundry store that opened first in Thorne's Marketplace in 1978. It moved to Center Street around 1980. It's bisexual owned by a progressive feminist woman named Judith Fine. And she used to offer dyke discounts. You go and say, you're a lesbian, and you get a dyke discount <laughs> on anything. And back in the day, Gazebo also offered butch femme runway fashion shows wow. for women only. How cool is that? Very cool. <laughs> so if we look across the street at First Churches, this, this church building here. 129 Main. Um, again, very supportive to our, our LGBT community. Here was held a production of the Laramie Project in 2002, as well as a discussion led by the Freedom to Marry Foundation in 2002. Northampton Pride has also held <laughs> fundraising events here. And the Trans Pride uh, had its fourth annual rally and celebration oh, yes. here in 2011. Uh, we're going up Main Street now to continue the tour up Main Street in front of Bucci's. Northampton for 15 to 20 years, and they also have a salon in Amherst. That's all I have to say about them. <laughs> <laughs> now we're going down to the Hotel Northampton area. This is where I get my haircut. Yeah. Oh, right there. Go to Hotel Northampton. Northampton. Uh, the Hotel Northampton 
is currently the meeting place for a lesbian group called Ladies Who Lunch, which meets regularly. They, there have been several social gatherings for lesbians and gay men at the hotel over uh, the last uh, several years. Then the other hotel in town, the Clarion, located at 1 Atwood Drive, was the first to offer lesbian wedding packages. Across the street, you're looking at the Calvin Theater. <laughs> oh, it says the Alvin. <laughs> the Calvin Theater is similar to the Iron Horse at Pearl Street in that it has hosted many queer performers. It's a much larger venue than the others. For example, Kate Clinton and Nancy Vogel performed here in 1985 to a sold out house. And Ellen DeGeneres performed here in 2002, and they had to turn people away from that. The next stop I'll tell you about is the Lesbian Calendar. And that's at the corner of Main and Pleasant Street. If you look at the building where Foreign Savings Bank is, on the floor right above it, that's where the Lesbian Calendar a monthly publication of lesbian groups, events, businesses, and all things happening for lesbians in the valley it was published out of an office there. It was co-edited by Pamela Kimmel and Marie Patton, and it ran from 1987 to 2001. The archives are, the section of minorities archives to be found in the Sophia Smith Collection at Smith College. This particular periodical is probably the best source of information for researchers who are studying lesbian life in Northampton during the period it was published, 87 to 2001. Prior to the lesbian calendar, Northampton had another lesbian publication. It was a newspaper called Old Maid. Old Maid, and first started publishing in spring of 1975. Lesbian Calendar inspired the creation of the Valley Gay Men's Calendar, a similar publication of monthly groups and events for gay men. And that was started in 1994 by Mark Fowles of TLC Productions. TLC, the Lesbian Calendar Productions which also produced the calendar. Um, I think I'll just stand here and talk about Pleasant Street. So down Pleasant Street, we're going to walk past it. It was the Pleasant Street Theater. Does everybody here remember the Pleasant Street? Everybody remember it? Does anyone not? You don't. OK, so it's where that, the Irish bar is now, the Irish pub bar. 27 Pleasant Street it used to be the Pleasant Street Theater until recently, actually. Um, they often showed queer-themed films, which was an outlet, and the only outlet in Northampton. For example, the movie, the lesbian movie By Design, was shown in 1983 there. Buddies, a film about AIDS, was shown there in 85 and a gay film festival called the Unity and Diversity Film Festival took place there in 1987. Pleasant Street Theater closed on June 8th of 2012. Pleasant Street the a Video, which was next door to it, which is now the, Yarns, the Yarn Store, they had one of the largest LGBT video rental collections in the area. And they also closed in 2011. Those uh, VHS and DVDs, uh, the entire video collection was permanently donated to Forbes Library because the community raised money to buy them and donate them. So there are LGBT DVDs that you can go and check out in, in Forbes. Oh, we're going to move on to um, the next stop. You talk here. Pleasant 
Street. Um, there's a few more locations we want to talk about that are too far to walk out to anyway. Um, at 267 Pleasant Street, uh, there was a store called Primitive Leather, and this was a queer-friendly fetish clothing accessory store. It was voted the best fetish clothing store by the Valley Advocate in 2002. It was run by a gay man named Master Harley, and now located there is Northampton Coffee. Um, at 317 Pleasant Street is the Queer Archives Project. Um, this is an archives run by gay community activist Bambi Gothier. The project began in 1991 as an outgrowth of two local ACT UP and Queer Nation chapters. It initially held organizational and subject files related to those groups, and it later expanded to include local gay organizations and the Northampton Pride Marches. Many materials related to the local queer community, post Stonewall, HIV AIDS, and the Radical Series are there. Um, then at 492 Pleasant Street is Divas, which used to be called Club Metro. Um, it, opened, All the way down. it opened as Club Metro in 1996, and it was a queer nightclub. It was renamed Divas in 2001, around the same time that the Grotto closed, which was where the North Star used to be. Um, the club is still called Divas today, and it is a the They host Drag Wars on Wednesdays. They also held Queen Esther's Drag Ball, sponsored by Beit Ahaba in 2009. They've also hosted several post-Pride rally parties. Okay. Okay, so also on Pearl Street, um, at 10 Pearl Street, the Pearl Street Nightclub, it's a nightclub and concert venue that held queer, dan queer nights with dancing. They sometimes held post-Pride dances. They hosted the Dance for Life Dance-a-thon to benefit the Design Industries Foundation for AIDS of Western Massachusetts in 1991. Um, they've also hosted many queer performers and fans. over towards the bridge, the railroad bridge. of you have survived this length of tour, I have to tell you the last three stops, actually we're going to be in one or two places, uh, and talking about a few stops, are really fascinating history. So come with me to the bridge.
And young men stood on top of that bridge, threw things down at the marchers. As the marchers passed under, they yelled, let's go, let's get rid of the faggots, and were quickly removed by the police.